Buju, Wago Shindigu, Minawa, Migizi, and Dodem, Gazagasqua, Jimekag, and Dunjiba. I'd like to share a little perspective on a really important book by Paolo Freire called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. In today's political and racial climate, it couldn't be more important to understand the thoughts and ideas of this incredible thinker. Essentially what Freire has to say is that all forms of oppression have a pedagogy, a way by which we are all instructed and enculturated to accept and participate in dealing out the oppression and in receiving it, and often both. And he says, because there's actually a pedagogy for oppression, there needs to be a pedagogy for the oppressed, a way to bring us into liberation. So here are a couple of the really important things that I learned from Paolo Freire's work. One is that oppression in all of its forms is complex and insidious and all of us no matter how advantaged or disadvantaged we think we are we all participate in the oppression so this is an example that i think of sometimes to help explain how oppression works if you take a group of people who were oppressed like the pilgrims a lot of times when we think of someone who's oppressed, we think of a group of people, like the pilgrims, and the people who are holding them down, beating them up, um, oppressing them, in that case, because of their religious beliefs. And it's tempting to think if we can just get the oppressed people away from those who are oppressing them, we'll have liberation. But it doesn't work like that. The pilgrims dead get away from the people who were oppressing them. They literally got into boats, went across the ocean, and there are you know, thousands of miles of ocean dividing them from the people who were oppressing them. Was that the end of oppression in Puritan culture? Hardly. Where was the oppression? oppression and where were the oppressors? What Freire would say is that the pilgrims carried the oppression inside of themselves when they went across the ocean. And it showed up in multiple forms. One was internalized oppression. That was shame, um, low self-worth, and things that were woven into Puritan culture. Another form was lateral oppression. So that was Puritans being mean to other Puritans. You get Salem witch trials and stuff like that. In addition to that, the pilgrims were mean to other oppressed groups. So they started, you know, beating up on other people, especially you can think of blacks and Native Americans, and the oppression cycle continued. In fact, Freire would say there are four pillars that prop up oppression. Only one is an external actor trying to keep people down. The others are happening inside of the oppressed community. So if we flash forward in time, another example would be what's going on with Native Americans. So there is an external form of oppression, right? There was orchestrated genocide. Um, there are all kinds of government policies and procedures and, you know, things like that, that do serve to make life more difficult for indigenous people. But a lot of the oppression is being reinforced inside of indigenous communities. So we will show up with low self-esteem, higher suicide rates, internalized blaming and shaming, we will be mean to other oppressed peoples. So homophobia, 
racism, anti-black sentiment, these things are all evident in indigenous communities. In addition to that, we have the internalized oppression. There are lateral oppressions, crabs in the bucket, native people, you know, being mean to other native people, intra-oppressed group oppression, right? And so that would be all the other isms. And if you think about it, the internalized, lateral, and intra-oppressed group oppression all serves to prop up white supremacy. So three-fourths of the work that enables oppression is happening inside the communities of the oppressed. Because we can't always control the outside actors, we have to look at the things that we can control because we can shape the way that we think and approach our internal thinking, our thinking of other people within our groups, and our thinking and actions around people in other oppressed and marginalized communities. So, if you're concerned about an ism, then we need to be concerned about all the isms and all the ways in which we may unknowingly be supporting racial caste, patriarchy, class structures that serve to keep most of the human population in some form of struggle that they should not have to face. This is part of the pedagogy for the oppressed. One of the other things that Paulo Freire does a good job of explaining is that there's never been a case in human history of an oppressing group liberating the oppressed. It doesn't work like that. Always the burden is upon the oppressed to seek their own liberation. It's not just that the oppressors will not be incentivized to liberate everyone else, but it's actually impossible to do. So the solution, the other part of the pedagogy for the oppressed is to force a dialogic or a dialogue between the oppressor and the oppressed. And again, a simple example helps illustrate it better. If you look at women's suffrage 100 years ago, that movement in the United States, it didn't happen because there are a bunch of dudes sitting around in the Senate smoking cigars saying, should we give our wives and daughters the right to vote? Sure, sounds like a great idea, let's do it. That was never gonna happen until women raised the issue, pumped their fist in the air, protested, got beat with police batons. And eventually, their action, social activism, and activity compelled the owners, orchestrators, and beneficiaries of patriarchy to engage in an unwanted and unwelcome dialogue with those issues. And eventually it pricked the consciousness of a nation and an all-male Senate dead vote for women's suffrage. Similarly, in the civil rights movement, dealing with the Jim Crow South, it was the social activism, it was, you know, marches and people being hosed down by water cannons and beat by police batons that forced people who wanted to ignore those issues and stay in their comfort with the oppressive status quo. And most white Americans were pretty comfortable with that status quo. Even today, a lot of people hearken back to the glorious 1950s as a time when things were better and more comfortable. So it was the oppressed who had to bear the burden of making everyone else uncomfortable enough to see the oppression and channel them 
into action. There has to be a dialogic between oppressor and oppressed. And here's a great Carl Jung quote that when two bodies meet, two personalities, if there's any reaction at all, both are transformed. Both the oppressor and oppressed get transformed through the dialogic, through social action and change. We all become more liberated, more fully humanized. These are the broad strokes for Paulo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed. Sometimes he's considered the grandfather of critical race theory. His ideas have been very formative in our thinking around class, race, gender, and a host of other fault lines in our society. It's not perfect. I kind of felt like I needed a bottle of aspirin and a thesaurus to get through his work, but he is a mad genius and it's really informative and instructive. I find it to be very helpful instead of looking at all the isms all at the same time to isolate variables and for example focus on race and look at how that impacts and also intersects with all of these other things. And as we apply and shift our focus from one lens to another, it's easier to see how these things function. Ultimately, there's no hierarchy of oppressions. They all intersect. It's not an either or, like what's driving disparities in our educational system? Is it economics or is it race? And I don't think it's either economics or race. I think it's economics and race and gender and sexual orientation and a host of other things too. We are humans, we are complex, but we are all dehumanized by any form of oppression and we all become more fully human and more fully liberated when we are able to pick up this toolbox to see, understand, and analyze the anatomy of oppression and seek to undo it in all its forms. This is a testy time politically. And there are a lot of people who are afraid that change is going to mean flipping roles between who is the oppressor and who is the oppressed. We will end up with oppressed white people and white erasure. And I think we should take all that energy put it together and fight oppression. And we will all benefit from that. Thanks for watching today. Miigwech. Thanks for watching today. I'm Anton Troyer. Let's keep in touch. I'm active on social media and my website has lots of information on my books, speaking engagements, free Ojibwe language resources, resources for teachers, and more. Miigwech.